2017 was an interesting year uh, for the city of Houston as a whole for a lot of reasons with the hurricane and other things uh, that happened. But uh, it was an interesting year for me as a sports fan. Uh, not as big of a deal, but I grew up, as many of you know, in Salt Lake City, Utah. We didn't have any, uh, any local baseball teams. We didn't have any local football teams, uh, Major League or NFL. And so uh, we had to figure out who we were going to be fans of. I did grow up a Utah Jazz fan. Um, I have now become a Rockets fan, I can happily say. Uh, but I grew up a Broncos fan because they were the closest uh, team and all their games were on TV. I grew up a Dodgers fan. Uh, when I was a little kid, my dad was a Dodgers fan, kind of raised us up to be Dodgers fans in the moment. And so I remember watching uh, the World Series in 1988 when I was really little, um, getting to watch the World Series. I just remember that being one of my first experiences, falling in love with the Dodgers. And so uh, all through my life, I was a Dodgers fan. And then we moved to Houston. That was the first time I lived in a city that had a major league baseball team you know, and an NFL team, had all the, all the major sports. And so we would always go to Astros games as often as we could. We'd try to go to Astros games. And when the Dodgers were in town, I'd try to get one, uh, one game where we could go to the game and I would wear a Dodgers hat with an Astros shirt. And my wife would scold me every single time. She'd say, babe, you cannot do that. That's not, that's not okay for you to do that. And I was just like, listen, I know, I, I know it's not right, but I'm, I'm, I'm torn. I have divided loyalties, right? Well, 2017, because the Astros had moved to the American League, uh, 2017 just so happened that the Astros and the Dodgers were in the World Series together. And so I had multiple people who knew me, including my wife, saying, all right, who are you going to cheer for? Because something has to give, right? At this point, your, devile, your, your uh, loyalties cannot be divided anymore. You can't sit on the fence. You have to cheer for one team or another. And I said, you'll have to ask me during uh, game one. And so partway through game one, my wife looks over and she says, all right, who do you find yourself cheering for? And I said, I'm definitely pulling for the Astros. I had realized I had been converted to an Astros fan uh, by that time. Uh, I, was, I was an Astros fan. I was a credible series. It was amazing. But in that moment, I realized, all right, I've got I've to kind of figure out where my loyalty really lies. Like if I have to choose between one or the other, I have to figure out where my loyalties lie. And by the way, all of us have decisions like that we have to make. You might say, well, I'm not really a sports fan. Every one of us in this room have decisions that we have to make that are like this, where we have to decide something has to give, where are my loyalties going to lie. When I proposed to my wife, I got down on a knee. Here's what I was saying. I'm going to let go of my loyalty to single life and I'm going to be married to you because I can't be married and be loyal to single living at the same time. Amen. Right? When we had kids, uh, whether we knew we were going to have them or not, whether it was, you know, we knew exactly when it was going to come or not, guess what? I wasn't just going to be a father of my children. I was going to be a dad to my children. And so my loyalties had to shift. Now all of a sudden my schedule looks different because my loyalty, I can't just do whatever I want. If you ever pursued some kind of degree at another stage in your life, you know exactly what this is like, right? Where you have to say, you know what? Some of my hobbies might have to go away right now because my loyalties have to shift. Something's got to give. If you've ever tried to eat healthy, you understand. I can't live in both spaces, right? Something's got to give. Where are my loyalties going to lie? And I want us to look, if you have your Bible open up to Galatians chapter 2, we're going to see that all of us, that something's got to give. We can't just sit on the fence. I want to read the passage, the five verses we're going to be looking at today. I want to read all of them together first, and then we will, we will continue on and kind of unpack them uh, verse by verse. Verse 17, Galatians chapter 2 says, But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean that Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. 
I want to pause for just a second and remind you where we were at. Last week, we talked about how Paul confronted Peter. Peter had been one of the ones who had, got, who had gotten the vision from the Lord, and he had started sharing the gospel with the Gentiles. Now he comes into Galatia. He's eating with the Gentiles. And then the Jewish believers come from, from Jerusalem. The, the Judaizers and Jewish believers come from Jerusalem. And then what happens is he starts pulling back from the Gentiles. And Paul says, that's hypocritical. What you're doing is wrong. If you remember last week, he said, it's very wrong what you're doing. And so this was a part, this is a continuation of this conversation where Paul is confronting Peter. But I want you to know that in, in the book of Acts where it records this confrontation a little bit, and in the book of Galatians, we don't see anywhere in the New Testament that tells us what Peter's response to Paul was. But I want you to know, if you look in Peter's letter, which was written after this letter, which was well after this time, Peter calls Paul a beloved brother. He says, you need to read the letters from our beloved brother, Paul. And he actually says that some of his letters are a little bit confusing. They're hard to understand, but you need to read these letters because they're very important, which tells you that he calls him a beloved brother. It tells you that there was some kind of reconciliation, some kind of repentance, some kind of restoration in their relationship. So we don't necessarily know exactly what it looked like, but Peter called Paul who confronted him, my beloved brother. I want you to know that, but understand that this is a continuation of that conversation of what he's saying. So with that understanding, let's look back at verse 17. Paul says, suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we're found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean that Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I'm a sinner. If I rebuild the old system of the law, I, or, I already tore down. Now, here's the problem. This is why he's bringing up this part of the conversation. He says, you know what? If I receive grace by, by faith, I, I enter into relationship with Jesus. I receive grace. And now all of a sudden I set aside the law and I don't, I'm not under the law anymore more? Would that mean that Jesus led me into a, a lifestyle of lawlessness? This is what they were concerned about. The Jewish believers were thinking, if you set aside the law and you're no longer under the law, then you're going to live a life of lawlessness, right? And so this is what they're understanding. This is what they're concerned about beyond just the fact that they're trying to get them to be circumcised and place them under the law, they're thinking, well, now they're just not gonna obey any of these things. They're not gonna live in, a, in the same way that we've always been told to live. They're not gonna live this way. And Paul says, of course, that's not what's happening. Jesus is not pulling them out from under the law so that they can live lawless lives. They're just not under the law anymore. This stems from a key misunderstanding about what the law was because the law was never intended to save us it was intended to show us that we need to be saved. When you understand that the law was always intended to show us the need for a savior, then that changes all of this stuff. And the problem was they thought it was intended to save them. So they were trying to keep the law, keep the law, keep the law was what they were trying to do all the time. But when you have this understanding that it was never intended to save us and it didn't have the ability to save us, the reason is because we couldn't keep the law all of us in this room are lawbreakers. You might say, well, I've never committed murder. I've never committed adultery. Well, guess what? Have you ever lied? If you've lied, you're a lawbreaker. You have broken the law, not just like the legal law in our land. You have broken God's law. If you've ever coveted, wanted something that didn't belong to you, coveted something that wasn't yours, you've broken the law. All of us in the room are lawbreakers. And because of that, the reality is the law could never save us. It was never intended to. It never could. It was always intended to point us to the need to be saved. And here's the other part that was really important. We have to understand that God has always been more concerned about our hearts than he is about our habits. It starts with what's in the heart, the inside versus the outside. And the law was intended to show us what was wrong with the inside because of what was wrong on the outside. And so that was the problem. You look at, at the life of David. God said, the man looks on the outside, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus, when he's, on the, on the, he's giving the, the Sermon on the Mount, he, he talks about these things. He says, you know what? You might say, well, I haven't committed murder. He says, I tell you that if, you've, if you hate, have hatred for somebody in your heart, you've murdered them. 
Oh, I haven't committed adultery. He said, if you lust over a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. Jesus has always been more concerned. God has always been more concerned about the heart than the habits of our lives. Because here's the reality. We can change the habits of our lives. We can change the outside, the things we do, and it doesn't require a change of our heart. You can change a lot of things about what you do. You can change a lot in your schedule. By the way, none of us will be able to perfectly change everything, okay? But you could change a lot of things on the outside and your heart could still be wrong. Jesus told the Pharisees, he called them whitewashed tombs. Why was he saying that? He said, the outside looks great. Everybody would look at it and say, that is beautiful. It is pristine. Your life on the outside is great, but you are dead on the inside. Jesus is pointing and saying, I'm not worried about the outside. I'm worried about the inside because I understand that the outside can look good and the inside still be dead. But here's the thing that we have to understand. You can have transformation on the outside without having transformation on the inside. But I need you to understand this. You can't have transformation on the inside without it transforming the outside. So Jesus is starting with the heart, the thing that really matters at the heart of it all is the heart of all of us. So Jesus is looking and focused on the inside. And this is what Paul is talking about in this moment as well. It's not just about what happens on the outside. It's about the heart. So Paul's saying, you would say, so does Jesus promote sin? Of course he doesn't promote sin. He's going to bring you into a different life. He's going to change your heart and the outside's still going to align with the law of God. Verse 19, it says, for when we tried to keep the law, or when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I might live for God. I want to remind you, if the law was never meant to save us, but to point us to a need for a savior, then I want you to understand this. If it was never meant to and never able to save us, then the law only does its job when we die to it. If it can't bring life to us, it only shows us where life is needed. The only way the law actually does its job is when we die to the law, when we stop trying to live up to everything in the law for the purpose of earning something, we're changed. We have to die to the law. Does that mean we don't do anything? Of course not, because the inside's changed and the outside is changed because of it. But he says we have to die to the law so that we might live for God. And then verse 20, this is where we're going to spend our final few minutes. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. Some of your translation says, I have been crucified with Christ. That actually is the term. I'm using this specific translation because I think it helps us understand a little bit better. But he says, I have been crucified with Christ. In the original language, that word crucified, the idea that I have been crucified with Christ is in the perfect tense. And here's what that means. It means I have been crucified with Christ. I am right now still being crucified with Christ. And I will remain in that state of being crucified with Christ. It is the perfect tense, meaning it is something that has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. It is always a process of me saying I am crucified with Christ. So that's what that word means. What he's saying is when I place my faith in Jesus, His death became my death. That's what Paul's saying. His death became my death. You might say, well, I don't really understand how that works. Let me, let me, let's go back to Romans chapter six. I want to look at Romans chapter six for just a second. I think this will help clarify. If if you remember from one of the first couple weeks, I talked about how Galatians is a lot like Romans. It's a little bit harsher, much shorter. Uh, You know, it's Paul's first letter. And then Romans is kind of an expansion of a lot of the ideas of Galatians. A lot of what he proclaims in God's word in Galatians is expanded on in the book of Romans. Romans chapter six, starting in verse one. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I just want to remind you, when we baptize, this is where the terminology comes from, right here. He says, if we have been united with him in death, 
like, like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. You see the same terminology, right? Our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. I want to clarify a couple things. This word baptism, first of all, the word baptizo, this word actually means to dunk or to immerse. If you wonder why we baptize the way we do, it's because the word literally means to dunk and to immerse. That's why we dunk and immerse people in baptism. But I also want you to understand this picture of what he's talking about in Romans chapter 6 is for you and I to be baptized into Christ, to be immersed into Christ. But I need you to understand something. He is not talking about water baptism. Romans chapter 6 is not talking about water baptism. It's not talking about what we did just a moment ago. Water baptism is a picture of what Romans 6 is talking about, that we are immersed in Christ. Baptism is not the immersion. That's immersion in water as a picture of the reality of what has already happened spiritually, that we have been immersed in Christ. You have to be immersed in Christ. I want to just tell you this, that you can be baptized a thousand times and still not be saved. Because if you have not been immersed, baptized into Jesus, into his death, into his burial, into his resurrection, you are not saved. You can be baptized over and over and over again, and it might clean you up, but you know what it won't do? Save you. You might be clean but you won't be saved. So I need you to understand that what he's talking about being baptized into Christ. Now, because this is a spiritual reality, for those of us who've placed our faith in Jesus, we are immersed now in Christ. We demonstrate that picture that the old life is dead and gone, buried. We are washed clean by the work of Jesus and we're raised to walk in a new life. Baptism does not do that. It only shows what has already happened. I even told the, the two students that got baptized earlier, I said, I said the, the water's not magical, but the step you took was a really big deal today. It's a really big deal that you take that step to let everybody know, because that's a step of obedience. Jesus has told you to do this, and so we're really proud of you. Not magical water. It's normal water, just like is in your house. We clean it up a little bit, but it's, but it's normal water. You have to be immersed in Christ. Here's here's the picture that salvation is a union. It's a union of relationship, first and foremost, that when you're saved, you now have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Your sins have been paid for. You are restored in relationship with Jesus, but it's also a union of experience. Because now when Jesus died, you died with him. Now here's the here's the blessing. You didn't have to go through all the pain. You didn't have to go through all the suffering. He went through that, but now you are united with him in his death, in his burial, and you will be united with him, by the way, in his resurrection. It's a a union of experience and relationships. So we identify with him in all those areas. So he says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. He says, I no longer live. I want you to know, first of all, that these, this is kind of one of the few times that Paul uses personal pronouns. A lot of times he's, he says we and us and stuff like that. This is one of those cases he says I. He is making a declaration of what happens at salvation and the life you live. If you want to live the Christian life, he says this is what it looks like. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. So I want to ask you a question. Who died? Jesus did. And then Paul is saying, because I was crucified with him, I no longer live. He says, my old self has died. I don't live anymore. He says, Christ lives in me. So I live this life in this earthly body. First of all, he said, I died. And now he says, so I live. I died, so I live. You might say, well, how does that make any sense? I don't understand. He says, I died, so now I live. He says, I live my life in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I need you to understand something, what he's talking about. We'll unpack this a little bit more here in just a second, but I need you to understand what he's talking about. When he talks about being in Christ, 
I, my life is now hidden with God in Christ. You hear phrases like that over and over and over again in Paul's letters, John's letter, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. I want to just help you understand something about what it means to be in Christ for a second. First, I want you to know what happens when we are in Christ. I'm going to read a few verses really quick, but 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you are in Christ, this is what happens. Colossians 1, 27. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're in Christ, and guess what? Christ is in you. You are now one. You see how this union is coming together. What happens when you're in Christ? These are the things that happens. What do you receive? Ephesians chapter one, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. By the way, if you are in Christ, how many spiritual blessings do you have? Every one of them, all of them. Every spiritual blessing is yours if you are in Christ. Christ. Now you might say, well, I, why don't I experience it? Are you living a life that shows and demonstrates that you're in Christ? Because when you step out of that, which all of us do, all of us make these mistakes. We walk in the flesh. We do the things we're not supposed to do. We don't, don't do the things we're supposed to do. Paul said it in Romans chapter seven, right? All of us do those things. You might say, well, why am I not experiencing that? Live in Christ. Verse seven, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's what we have in Christ. In Christ, we were, verse 11, in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who are the first to put our hope in Christ might, might be for the praise of his glory. Verse 13, when you believed, you were marked in Christ with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now you have the Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ, guess what? He's in you. Guess what? You have the Holy Spirit. In Christ, you have those things. So what happens to our life? Here's how, here's how John describes it. First John chapter two. He says, we know that we have come to know God. We, we know that we are in Christ if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Christ in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. He says, the way I live, this life I now live, I live by faith because Christ is living in me. Years ago, there was a bumper sticker that a lot of people would see, and it would, the bumper sticker said, Jesus is my co-pilot. Some of you guys have seen that bumper sticker. And it's a funny bumper sticker, but it's, uh, biblically, it's completely wrong. Theologically, it's heretical. Because I want you to know, Jesus is not your co-pilot. He's, he's not the one that you're, you're driving the car. If you're in Christ, you're not driving the car, and he's making suggestions. Hey, hang a left here, hang a right here. It's a little bit different. Now, I want to I pull back for just a second. You've got to run with me. How many of you have seen the movie Ratatouille? Raise your hand if you've seen the movie Ratatouille, all right? So we have a picture of this. It's a rat, right, who's using the guy's hair to move his body. And if you've seen it, what happens is they're trying to figure it out. The rat knows how to cook, but this guy doesn't know how to cook, right? So the rat's trying to help him cook. This is the whole picture. And so he's trying to control this guy. And here's what happens. He blindfolds him, and they're making a mess, they're causing so many problems. They can't get it right. He's trying everything he can to do the right thing. And what's happening is this rat's trying to control him over and over again, using his hair, lifting his arms, doing all this kind of stuff. And what happens is over time, he begins to figure it out. He begins to figure out how to allow the rat to control him. Now, I'm not saying it's a biblical movie, but here's what I am saying, that it can be a lot like how it is for us as we learn to walk with the Lord to understand how he moves and how we allow him to move in and through us. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ living in me. The way I get to do it is to allow him to live in me. The only way we can do that is by fully surrendering. 
The problem is not that he's leading us the wrong way. The problem is that we're not fully surrendered. We think we're the pilot and he's just giving us a little help on the side. He's in the passenger seat trying to navigate for us. That's not how this works. We say, God, I give you full control. I surrender everything to you. This is how we do this. So it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live this life in this earthly body by trusting the word faith right there. He says, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God. There's a missionary in the 1800s. His name was James Calvert. And here's what happened. He, uh, he felt called to go as a missionary to the Fiji Islands. And uh, there was a lot of, there was some cannibal tribes, cannibalistic tribes in the Fiji Islands. And so he went. And while he was on his way, the captain of the ship that was trying to get him there that he was riding tried to get him to change his mind. Here's what the captain said. The captain said, you will lose your life and the lives of those uh, those with you if you go among such savages. You will lose your life and the lives of those with you if you go among those savages. Here was his response. This is his only response. He said, we died before we came here. He said, we already died. Can you imagine a life that you say, you know what? God, you're directing my life. And I might not want to go, but I died to me. So if you're the pilot, and by the way, I'm not even the co-pilot who gets to try to make suggestions. A lot of us want to be the ones in the passenger seat saying, God, what do you think you're doing? (laughs) We're not even the co-pilot. We're just along for the ride. If we understand this properly, we're just along for the ride. He says, I died to me. I might not want to go, but God has called me. And therefore, I don't have a choice because he's the pilot. I go where he goes. I do what he, do, what he does. I say what he says. That's all I do. More and more and more as we surrender more to him, we understand this verse. I've been crucified with Christ. I don't live anymore. Christ lives in me. So I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. There's an acrobat, a French acrobat known as the Great Blondin. He came over in the mid-1800s, in the mid-1800s and he wanted to be the first person to cross uh, the Niagara Falls on, on a tightrope. And so he did. He had a two-inch tightrope, and he crossed for, uh, over from Canada to the U.S., did it a few times, and over, they actually said over 300 times, kept doing it. And every single time, he promised to be more and more daring. And I've heard a lot of stories about him, but there was a statement that he made that I had never heard before. He crossed over to the side, and he had done things. He, he went across, nobody believed he could. Then he'd stopped in the middle and, you know, brought up a bottle of wine from the maid of the mist, the boat, you know, brought up a bottle of wine and drank it and then kept going. And then he took a wheelbarrow across, and he took a table and chairs and sat down uh, while he was out there in the middle on this two-inch tightrope. Uh, incredible, incredible acrobatic strength and ability. Uh, like I said, took a, took a wheelbarrow, did a bunch of other things going across the cartwheels and, and tumbling and all that kind of stuff across the tightrope, held onto it by one hand and just pretended like he was going to fall. It wasn't really falling. Well, one time he got over to the Canadian side, took a little rest and then kind of reappeared. And on his back was his manager. And here's what happened. He had said to his manager, which, by the way, uh, his, his manager, uh, his name was Harry Colcord. But before they went out, this phrase really just stood out to me. I never, never heard it before, but he said, Look up, Harry. You are no longer Colcord. You are Blondin. He's on his back. He says, Until I clear this place, be a part of me, mind, body, and soul. If I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to do any balancing yourself. He says, you're no longer Colcord. You're Blondin. By the way, all he had to do was cling. And he says, if I sway, that's what you do. If I don't sway, you don't sway. You just hold on to me and you do what I do. This is the picture of what Paul is talking about. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. When he sways, I sway. When he moves, I move. When he talks, I talk. Where he goes, I go. I'm clinging to him. It's him living in me. Here's the beauty of it. 
He doesn't just say the Son of God, I have faith in the Son of God. No, no, no. He, po- he puts in there, he says, I have faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Don't miss that. The Son of God, the creator of the universe, loves you and gave himself for you. If you want to know where to put your faith, you want to know where to put your trust for your salvation, it's only in Him. But for your life after salvation, it's still only in Him, the one who loves you and gave Himself for you.